and welcome to episode, I mean, 67. I'm going to have to stop doing numbers. Numbers are not my forte. I hope you have all had a lovely weekend. I had a bit of a, a turnaround. I was going to do a topic, which I'll now do next week, because I spent the weekend in Derbyshire with my sister. My sister had an exhibition. She's an artist, and I went with her as her roadie and moral support, uh, and... We met this lovely couple who were housing the art for the weekend and they clearly thought that I was some sort of bonkers person for having a true crime podcast. And so I said to them, have there been any any weird stories locally, anything I should know about? And they remember the case that we're going to cover today. And I was so, it was such a beautiful area that I'd never visited before and I don't think I would have done had it not been for the exhibition. It was completely not what I was expected. So although I'm going to tell you a a grim story today, please don't let it put you off. Um, I've called it the Matlock Bath Murders, but in fact, I think it's near a Cromford. But let's not be pernickety. (laughs) Today we're going to talk about the murder of Lorraine Underwood and Peter Thompson. Now, Cromford is 17 miles north of Derby in the Peak District. Cromford is 17 miles north of Derby and is one of the significant sites of the Industrial Revolution where Richard Arkwright built the world's first ever water-powered cotton mill in 1771. The Cromford Mill buildings and housing for workers to staff the factories form part of the Doant Valley Mills and is now recognised as a World Heritage Site. We are going to be going to Cromford in the late 1970s. Now, I've watched a lot of footage of, of Cromford from the 1970s. I haven't got a lot of the history but I've seen a lot of the photos and the development is crazy. I always wonder if people in 40 years 50 years time are going to look back at the rows and stuff that we have now and they're going to look really kind of outdated and quaint uh but it is an incredibly beautiful place even now it was much more rural and stunning in the 70s but also the couple we're going to talk about today i'm going to share a photo of them on social media they look much older than their years the 70s the 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 fashion the eyewear always made for people to look slightly older than they really were. 15-year-old Lorraine Underwood lives in Cromford near Matlock Bath in Derbyshire. She'd been seeing her boyfriend, 18-year-old Peter Thompson, an apprentice welder for about a year, 18 months. They are a really sweet couple and keen motorcyclists. And on the Easter Sunday of 1979, Peter drives his motorcycle from his home to Cromford to pick up Lorraine at about 1.30 in the afternoon. He leaves his, if you can hear a strange grunting noise, my oldest dog, I think, was a bit disappointed that I left for the weekend. So she's very close by to the microphone. So Peter arrives on his motorcycle. He then leaves his motorcycle at the Underwood house and they set off for what is referred to in lots of articles as a lover's walk. Now, we're going to get into this later. I I swear I'm not trying to deliberately read something into this that isn't there, but it's referred to as a lover's walk a lot. We will bless you. We'll mention peeping Toms later. And I slightly wonder if in the 70s and if especially you know if you're you're on a motorcycle and not in a car and you want some some alone time with your other half whether a walk was the way to do it and that was a sort of socially accepted thing uh because there seems to be lots of mention of it being a lover's walk they were last seen by friends near matlock bath between 3 and 3 30 that afternoon When they did not return, Lorraine's mother wasn't concerned. She trusted Peter. He had stayed over at their house. Both families believed the couple were married when they were older. Everyone approved of this relationship. Everyone, you know, everyone from Lorraine's family loved Peter. Everyone from Peter's family loved Lorraine. 
Uh, but when they still weren't, weren't home after midnight, Lorraine's mother reports them missing. His motorbike is still at home. So that she knows they can't, they wouldn't have gone that far, really. Uh, it's not like they've come back, taken the motorcycle and gone off somewhere together. And the police start what would become an extensive search. Initially, they were concerned that the couple may have fallen down an old mine workings. They're, it's a very uh, old mining town. There's lots of disused quarries and old mine shafts and things. So the pair knew the area really well, as you would if you'd grown up there. So they sort of thought that it wouldn't be the case that they'd have fallen in. But that was initially the concern. So 70 police officers and specialist cave rescue teams started the search and then helicopters were brought in and nothing was found. So about three days into the search, the police then started to suspect that the young couple may have eloped, though the families believed they would have at least taken some spare money, some some clothes with them if that had been the case. And also they probably would have gone on Peter's motorbike. Also, as I said, all the families approved of this relationship. So, and the couple could have married legally with parental permission. Once Lorraine was 16, she's 15. It seems unlikely they had, I think said that they wanted to wait until they were older to get married. It wasn't implied that they were sort of desperate to do it. ASAP. So two weeks later, at the end of April, the mountain rescue team find the body of Lorraine Underwood buried under stones and ivy in Ball Eye Quarry. She was undressed from the waist down and had been beaten around the head with a blunt object. Now, police say that they are looking for Peter to speak to him about Lorraine's murder and his father, 53-year-old Morris Thompson, appeals through the media for his son to contact them. Peter's motorbike is still at Lorraine's house and his father is actually convinced that Peter is lying injured somewhere, unable to move or call for help. At one point, Morris Thompson had been told that his son had called the police station before Lorraine's body had been found to say that they were both safe and well. But there, that, there seems to actually, this obviously, of course, has not taken place. Now, Ball Eye Quarry at the time was an active limestone quarry in between Matlock and Cromford. So Lorraine had obviously not been too far from home when she'd been attacked. They p- keep putting out requests through the media for Peter to get in contact with them. But a week or so later, they find Peter's body just about 280 yards away from where they had found Lorraine's and again he's been buried under large stones and ivy branches. Now a post-mortem reveals that Lorraine's been beaten over the head four or five times with what looks like a big stone or the butt of a, a gun. The state of her clothing suggested that she'd been raped from that's all I can glean. There is no confirmation from the postmortem as to whether she had been raped or not. And I wonder if that's because after two weeks uh, on the moor, after two weeks on the hill, it was difficult to tell whether some certain amount of decomposition had taken place. Peter had been shot in the chest from four or five feet away and then shot in the back of the head from about one foot. So, Police declare that this is obviously murder, that it's motiveless, and they interestingly say that it's the work of a sadist. It's a very interesting choice of word, I think. Um, Obviously, we know that Lorraine has been assaulted, um, but there's not a lot of information out there. I'm getting most of this info from the press, from old newspapers. So whether they just don't share a lot of the information in the papers at the time, I don't know, but they they describe this murderer as a sadist. They are looking for a killer who they believed would strike again. They, at the time, 
there there was obviously less knowledge of of true crime than than we have now and it was just believed that this must be a maniac going round uh, at the start of a killing spree uh, they then ask for any wife or girlfriend again they're assuming it's a man they ask for any wife or girlfriend who may be concerned with their partner's behavior or if they didn't know where they were or if they've seen something they encourage these women to come forward and one person or a couple of people it reports that they heard a scream echo through the hills at about 4 p.m that easter sunday and that's been able to give them an approximate time of when peter died and lorraine's attack began a family come forward who've been out walking on the hills that day when the couple were murdered and they'd seen the couple walking hand in hand below them and they'd been shadowed by a bald middle-aged man in a green anorak carrying something bulky. So they, the police assume that this anorak is not going to be easy. It is going to be really common, but it, it turns out that it's got a very specific red and green tartan pattern. So they go, go, you know, that they have that to go on to look out for. Now the couple are buried. They have a funeral. They're buried side by side in a double grave overlooked by her parents' home. And as the funeral procession passes through the streets of Cromford, shops are closed, people draw their curtains, police stop and salute the hearse as it goes past. It's a huge event. The The whole town is, is just horrified at what's happened to this lovely couple. Now, weirdly, in May 1979, a woman known only as Kathy comes forward. She has rung the police three times but always hung up and won't give her name she then speaks to a reporter and gives her name only as Kathy and she says that she was having a picnic with her family in the hills that day and witnessed the murder of Lorraine she said that that her whole family saw two men messing about with Lorraine and it had got out of hand and they had beaten her with a gun she hadn't come forward earlier because she was concerned for the welfare of her family and then a death threat was allegedly phoned into the lo local radio station warning Kathy to keep her mouth shut. So police spend a lot of time trying to track her down. They can work out that she phoned from the Nottingham area. And then when the death threat comes in, they put police in the area which they believe she lives in to make sure that she is safe. They eventually track her down and somehow work out that she's just making it all up. And she is later referred to as the hoaxer and she is threatened with prosecution but is let off without being prosecuted. I just think this is so weird. There's a lot of talk of her in the paper. I just don't know why you do this. I guess for your five minutes of fame or you know it just seems like such a sick thing to do when you know that um these families have lost their children i mean 18 he's an adult just um it just seems like such a horrible thing to do i, I feel like kathy should be well and truly ashamed of herself so the police are interviewing they interviewed thousands of people in relation to this case including the president of the Midlands Hells Angel as motorbikes had been seen parked nearby and the police even carried out a reconstruction on the 27th of May of what they believed could have happened having requested that anyone who was in the area on the day returned so that it was a really closed off thing but they got some of the bikers that had been there that day they came back for the reconstruction the picnickers the walkers um one woman comes forward and she was an artist she'd been on the hills at dawn the day after the murders painting and she had seen a man in a red and green tartan jacket running from the area where the bodies would later be found now this is a similar jacket to one that's been reported before 
um, the police were on the hunt to find where the jacket had been bought from to see if they could then track down the purchaser. And this, in many ways, points to how much easier life was before the internet, because, of course, it's very, you know, searches are very quick on the internet. But now you can order a coat from anywhere, basically anonymously, unless the police can log into your computer they can't tell where you've ordered it from whereas then there are only a few places that you would be ordering specific clothing from um the artist was able to draw a picture of the man she'd seen and the police would then use that to show the people they were interviewing to see if they could identify him now it, the police weren't just interviewing people at random they knew the type of shotgun that had shot peter and they looked into a list of those registered to own shotguns and then narrowed it down to who was in the area on the day of the murder. So I, I feel like I'm one of those people that bangs on about the gun laws in this country versus America. And I think maybe Americans think that we can't, like no one owns guns here. And you totally can. You just have to get a license. You have to be on a register and you have to get... You have to have it locked up and you have to have it checked annually that you do have it locked up. And um, so it does make it very easy. Obviously, there are always going to be people who get around this and do this illegally. And at the time, the police considered having an amnesty on unregistered shotguns so that anyone who had one wanted to just get rid of it because it wasn't registered. They could just drop it off. Now, on the 18th of May, they interview local man Arthur Hall, who is a happily married father of two, and he denies owning a gun. He, I think he's on the register, um, but he says, you know, that's not true anymore. I don't have a gun. But at the beginning of June, police frogmen searching in the River Derwent found Rem uh, bits of a, a dismantled, a chopped up, a sawn up a shotgun. So they believe that to be the murder weapon. Now, they go back and interview Arthur Hall. And he says he has an interest in guns, but nothing to do with the murders. But this is not strictly true. It turns out that 38-year-old Arthur Hall had handed in his notice at his work shortly after the murders had happened, and he told his work that his wife had left him, and he now had to look after his children. Now, not only had his wife not left him, but his kids were teenagers. The support they would have needed was financial, so giving up his job to stay home to look at his kids who weren't at home all day and who would have needed money makes no sense whatsoever. And then a few days later, he calls his wife, confesses to the murders, and tells her that he's taken 400 tablets. Luckily, she and his brother, one of his brothers, Les, managed to get to him in time to save him. What happens next is incredibly bizarre. Once he's confessed to his wife, they have a family conference with some of his siblings, not his mother, notably, to decide Arthur's fate. They basically think there are two choices. Either encourage Hall to kill himself, which he'd already attempted once since the murders by taking the 400 tablets, or turn himself in. And they sit there for a couple of hours talking this through. Arthur apparently doesn't say anything throughout. And his wife sits with her head in her hands and cries, understandably. And they eventually decide that he should turn himself in. And so on the 12th of June 1979, Hall, accompanied by family members, goes to the murder incident post at Cromford Meadows and asks to speak to the officer in charge, to whom he said, the pressures have got too much. The police officer says, what, what are you talking about? And he says, I'm confessing to the murders of Lorraine Underwood and Peter Thompson. Arthur Hall had lived in Cromford for most of his life and lived apparently happily with his wife and two teenage children. He had no history of violence and he did have... 
a history of depression, which has seems to have started when he was about 17. He had attempted suicide twice before, once when he was 18 and again when he was 23. He, obviously, this is Derbyshire in the 1970s. There was not a lot of uh, mental health help at the time and probably even less so for men. It was really not a done thing for men to talk about. Um, he's a boiler man with a firm base in Matlock and was keen on walking the hills and shooting birds and rabbits. So a friend came forward after Hall was arrested and said he'd seen Hall with a sawn-off shotgun a few days before the murders, and after the murders, Hall had asked him not to mention it. Initially, Hall said that the shooting of Peter Thompson was an accident. He said he'd been up in the woods shooting, had turned and shot, and Peter was there. And um, he'd hit Peter in the back, and... Lorraine had run off screaming and he'd followed her and hit her in the head to try and stop her screaming. He denied sexually interfering with Lorraine and, you know, he'd completely shot Peter by accident. He then said he'd cut up and disposed of the gun in the river, which they had found. Hall then changes his story. Mm -mm. He said he'd been shooting rabbits by a wall and Peter had told him to clear off. Hall said that this had filled him with rage and he'd shot Peter in the chest. He says, I just jumped over the wall and shot him in the chest. He made me mad. It turns out, eventually, he would say that Peter had called him a piker, which is a local term for a peeping Tom, which is much more apt, I think. And I wonder... This all ties in with what I was saying earlier. Now, I don't know any of this and I didn't know my hosts well enough to ask them. But I wonder if you wanted some privacy with your beloved when you were that age and you all lived at home. And, you know, I don't think you slept over in each other's rooms and all of that, whether you would go off to the hills, to the woods for some privacy and if that was the case, whether all this walking in the hills and the shooting of rabbits and birds that Hall did was actually because he was a peeping Tom, because he knew what the kids were up to and whether that's actually what happened on the day. He was peeping on Peter and Lorraine. Uh, So Hall then described how he beat Lorraine beating her about the head and face several times with the gun, and then he raped her as she lay dying. He then went and shot Peter in the back of his head to put him out of his misery before stealing their watches in the hopes that police would think it was a robbery. Which leads me to believe that he was, in fact, a piker, already aroused by what he was watching and and frustrated and angry to be caught in the act. There's something... um, I don't know. I think it'd be one thing if he was filled with rage and wanted and and shot Peter and then felt bad and had to dispose of the witness. But the rape for me, I, I don't know. For a man who's not reported to be violent to his wife, she doesn't seem to suspect him at all. To be aroused enough to commit a rape after something as shocking as shooting someone, especially with a shotgun in the chest, that is not pleasant. And beating someone about the head, for a lot of people, if they were doing that out of fear, um, they wouldn't necessarily find it arousing. So uh, that I find intriguing to know whether he was, in fact, a peeping Tom. I think a piker is a much better word. Peeping Tom never sounds as sinister as it is um and whether this was an escalation that i don't think was always going to happen he obviously can't live with himself having done it it's not like you know we know of a lot of predators for whom it's then like oh i I do this now where i kill people and rape their girlfriends um but yeah that i find quite intriguing 
Arthur Hall's mother, Olive, said she knew that her son had committed the murders before he confessed. She said she'd had a premonition, a vision of the murder scene with two bodies lying on the ground and her son standing over them with a gun. Arthur Hall never mentioned the murders to his mother, even when he visited her just before his trial started. He didn't mention the murders, the trial, anything. She also was very notably absent from the family meeting about whether he should turn himself in. She said Arthur, who was one of nine, was often withdrawn and insular as a child and spent a lot of time walking on the hills. She told of a time that Arthur had been dating a girl who had broken up with him and he'd taken it really badly. He had been on his way to see her and had found her walking in the hills with another man and he had just, it had said he'd taken him ages to get over if he had ever gotten over it. Olive Hall said the girl at the time looked a lot like Lorraine Underwood and she believes that seeing Lorraine and Peter might have reminded him of that incident and he just lost it with rage. She thinks it can be the only reason she was sure he didn't know the couple before he killed them. So that could, of course, be the case. But I just find that sudden leap to violence quite extreme. So I wonder if there's something his mother doesn't know. In another twist, Arthur Hall had gone about in a gang with Lorraine's mother, Margaret, when he was younger and he'd had a crush on her. They had briefly gone out, but it come to nothing. After Lorraine's murder, Margaret said the memory of her brief relationship with her daughter's murderer made her sick. Weirdly, this would not be Margaret's only dalliance with a murderer. Nine years earlier, she has, she's divorced at this time, she had been stepping out with a male friend who, unbeknownst to her, was also having an affair with his boss's wife. This man would then go on to shoot his boss and be jailed for life. In court for sentencing, Hall pleads guilty to the two murders and then he springs for the door and he is jumped on by seven police officers and then he's taken down to the cells with a bleeding nose and then he's returned having been restrained in manacles 15 minutes later his lawyer apologized and says it hadn't been an attempt to escape but pressures were running high um hall pleads guilty to both murders and is given two life sentences with the judge saying i regard you as so dangerous that life imprisonment should mean precisely what it says and that is the sad story of the Matlock Bath murders. I knew as soon as I arrived in Derbyshire that I was going to have to do a story set there. It is absolutely stunning. So if anyone is looking for a UK-based visit somewhere, I can really recommend Worksworth, Matlock. There's an aquarium in Matlock, unlike any that you get to see nowadays. Give me a uh, Matlock Aquarium over London Aquarium any day. It's just divine. And yeah, please email me your spooky Halloween stories for me to share on our Halloween episode. And you can do that at Monday Night Review at gmail.com or you can message me on social media where we are at the Monday Night Review on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. I'd love to hear from you, so do send me a message. Big shout out to all our patrons on over at Patreon. I love you. You make me happy. I hope you are loving the mini sides and extra content that you get over there. And until next week, be kind, stay safe. Always check the back seat before you drive.